Hey, what's going on, guys? Taxation is theft, and we are back. Um, I've got a special guest with me today, and we're going to talk about some pretty interesting subjects. So please welcome Pat Ruckert. How's it going? Very well. Awesome. Very well. So now um, I met you through a mutual friend, and we, we've had a few conversations um, most most interestingly, the the I remember the first thing you said to me was you don't believe in taxation is theft, and I was like, okay, well, these are the these are the kinds of people I like to have conversations with because if you keep talking to the same people who agree with you on everything, then nobody learns anything, right? That's that's right, it's, <laughs> especially in the political and intellectual environment of the country today. Yeah, and I I think it's um I, I actually bring this up a lot. Um, there's kind of like this this stigma that you're it's it's impolite or it's it's uh not socially acceptable to talk about politics um over dinner in public at work um in these other places and some people get really offended if you try to bring up any political topic and that of course is why i think we're in such a mess because nobody wants to talk about anything either they want to fight about it or they they it's forbidden to talk about which are kind of the two extremes the, I well, I would add to that is is that most Americans today really don't know very much about anything, you know, and and that is is in large part why they don't want to talk about it because they don't have the intellectual confidence in themselves that they actually know something, you know, they, they'll take something off Fox or off CNN or a you know, slogan or the, and 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 that's about the end of it, but the uh, beyond uh, uh, slogans and really shallow rhetoric. analysis or view or rhetoric, you know, there, there there is not much there in most Americans these days. Yeah, it's it's true, and I think, um, I mean, I, I see that for a lot of reasons. For some people, they don't want to deal with it just because there's so much. They're on they're on overwhelm, and they don't want to deal with it. For others, they think. Pretty much everything that comes out of the TV is lies, which in many cases is true. Um, you don't know what to believe. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's, you know, people are just tired of trying to have to figure, you know, like, here's an example. You see something on TV, you say, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm upset about this and something should change. And then you go have a conversation with somebody. And the next thing you know, they're calling you an idiot because you told them something that you saw on TV. And it's like, well, Wait, so is, was this not true? Did the TV, did the news lie to me? Um, and, and it puts people in, in pretty um, difficult situations to, to want to talk about it, po anything political. Well, the, uh, you know, that goes to what I, what I said already, that, that there's real lack of confidence in people actually knowing anything. Uh, and, and so the, then they just get scared. Right? Yeah, and 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 then throw out a you know, calling you a name or something. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so you proposed a topic that I thought was interesting because this is um, one thing. One thing that um, I guess I should say about it is, so I used to be completely politically ignorant. I wanted nothing to do with politics. I didn't have time for it. I wasn't interested in it. All these other things. Um, and then 2008 came around, and um, I remember as as much as I, I tell people I had my heart broken by Obama because he didn't live up to his promises when I voted for him the first time, um, that was when the, the big financial collapse hit, and that was when, um, you know, every, that's, that's when I started paying attention to things and when I started getting interested. So um, so you brought up the topic, hey, let's talk about the the – upcoming financial collapse, which I've always thought is just around the corner since 2008. Um, but let's let's talk about that. So what's what, in your opinion, is the next upcoming financial collapse? Well, two days ago, September 15th, is the 10 year anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which set off the 2008 banking financial collapse, which then, in a bipartisan spirit, the Congress first voted against the $800 billion bailout, and then Obama and McCain, the presidential candidates at the time, went into the Congress, 
and Obama especially threatened the Black Caucus. You vote for this, you know, and then uh, uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I forget his name now, from Southern California, after the vote to actually pass the bailout, said, we were threatened with martial law if we do not pass this bailout, right? So, so that was the anniversary of two days ago, right? But, but a month ago on August 15th, was the 47th anniversary of what really began the collapse that we had 10 years ago and and we're heading into again. But that was when Nixon pulled the plug on the dollar, uh, uh, broke the, the connection between the dollar and gold, and initiated a... Uh, a uh, you know, a completely deregulated international financial system where no currency was stable, all were subject to speculation. And within a few months of August 15, 1971, where previously over 90% of all international financial transactions had something to do with physical goods or actual trade or services, but within a few months, it completely reversed. 90% was pure fi- currency speculation in, uh, of international financial transactions. So, so what are we looking at now? Right? Uh, well, I'll just read a couple, just a couple of things from the last few days here. Uh, CNBC TV, September 11th, reporting on a Moody's Investor Service report. Quote, is another corporate debt crisis lurking? And, uh, and honed in on the U.S. corporate debt, which in 2007 peak of corporate debt of $12.7 trillion, it is now $15.9 trillion worse. Triple B junk, that is one little step above pure junk bond status, has gone from 700 million to 3 trillion of the 15.9 trillion debt is now junk bonds, right? Uh, and that's and that's uh, about one quarter of all bank lending, by the way, right? So, New York Times, September 12th, the next day, the next financial calamity is coming. Here's what to watch: corporate debt. Now, the uh, uh, so without without a lot more detail, I, I, actually I give you just a couple more uh, items. Uh, Italian economists uh, a couple days ago warned the financial system is today more overblown than in 2008, and of course the lesson from Lehman Brothers collapse uh, has not been learned. He said, we have several trillions in derivatives now, uh, which is capitalization of a few dozen times higher than global GDP. And most of that is uh, collateralized financial leverage. Now, just to, to, to add a political side to this, uh, because everyone knows, well, there's a hell of a hell of an attempt to remove President Trump from the presidency right now. It's a coup d'etat, or attempted coup d'etat. And a uh, Willie Wimmer, who's the former deputy defense minister in Germany, in an interview a couple of days, two or three, four days ago, said the removal of Trump from the presidency will put the world on a path to World War III. So the uh, uh, China, Russia, you know, other major uh, nations have had over the last few days, you know, similar articles to that of the New York Times and, and the Bloomberg one in terms of warning we're heading for a new crash. Uh, you know, student debt, for example, is now one and a half trillion dollars, right? You know. And most of that will never be paid. We know that. Right? 
So, so something's going to crack at some point here. Uh, it might it might be uh, uh, Turkish or Argentine uh, bankruptcy of major corporate and financial debt because f funds are just flowing out of those countries and their currencies are collapsing. Argentine currency collapsed 30 percent in the last month against the U.S. dollar. So vulnerabilities are all over the place. So I'll I'll stop there on that side. That gives us something yes. to go. So, um, so there's a lot of interesting points that you brought up there. I, I think, I mean, so a lot of the things that you say, you know, uh, like, so, so for example, there's, there's one that you said, um, or you quoted someone as saying, um, if, if Trump, if Trump were removed from the white house, that would start world war three. That I, I think is, that's almost kind of like an, an unpredictable, almost, almost propaganda. It's, it's, um, there's I, I don't think that's that's really founded. Um, but when you talk about all the debt, that definitely is um, like an actual, you know, tangible symptom of of a pretty big problem. Um, and so I, I think I've I've you know, I've been looking at a lot of these um, a lot of these debt issues. And, you know, where it comes from is it's always government tampering with monetary systems, which is one of the reasons I believe government shouldn't have power to do that. We shouldn't be using um, government based uh, fiat currencies, whether, you know, whether there's something like a gold standard or Bitcoin or something else that we can switch to. Um, that solves a lot of the problem because a lot of the lending comes from banks being able to, you know, use a fractional reserve system and lend out, you know, 10 times what they actually have in assets. But it's the government that says, like, so, so, you know, if I had a thousand dollars, I couldn't lend out ten thousand dollars because eventually, you know, even if I were keeping my own accounts, eventually someone would come back and say, hey, I want my money and I wouldn't have it. Um, but what the government does is they say, well, we're going to insure it. So basically, you're allowed to make these extremely risky loans. You're allowed to, to lend out ten times as much money as you have, but we're going to insure it. So it's OK. Um, and the reality is, you know, the, the loans are still risky things do eventually collapse if, if things you know go wrong and you're and you end up with the government saying oh well we said we're going to insure it so we'll we'll cover it but the reality is they don't have the money to cover it they have to borrow and print it so it's 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 kind of like you know this the whole foundation of this system is built on top of um you know this this what i call fraudulent monetary system um, that, that basically allows them to create money out of thin air. And not only are they creating it, they're creating it, You know, it's one thing if you just print a bunch of money, it causes inflation, which is one problem. But if you print the money and you distribute it, it's not as bad as if you print the money and distribute it and then say, but you all have to pay it back to me with interest because now that much money doesn't even exist. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, that kind of compounds the problem. What do you think about that? Well, the uh, in the last ten years, what did they do? Right. Well, they called it quantitative easing, mm -hmm. right? where the central banks just literally you know, they didn't print the money; they they just digitally did a few click clicks yeah. on the computer, right? But it's over four trillion dollars, and what did they the central banks do with it? They bought corporate debt uh, from, from uh, that the, the was, uh, in many cases, worth virtually nothing. But mm -hmm. they, play, they paid full face value for it, right? And so, uh, so they just pumped, you know, at least $4 trillion into the financial system. And it's sort of like... Uh, uh, Trump's uh, uh, tax cut, right? Uh, because it was not actually, it did not include something that uh, the Kennedy administration had, a, 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 a uh, investment tax credit type of element to it. It said, okay, you can just bring your money back here, right? And what happened to most of it? Something like 70, 80%. Uh, of both the corporate or the the tax cut that they received and the money they brought back from overseas 
went into buying their own stock, right? which, which drove up the stock market for the last damn near a year now. Uh, uh, and what went into investment in new plant and equipment to expand the real economy? Virtually nothing, nothing at all. And, and so I, th I think uh, where I'm going to divert from you is on this question of uh, a, uh, the way, essentially, the way you put it is the government, you know, does this, right? Uh, where, whereas what I would say is there's two systems. You know, there, there is what we have now, a completely corrupt, virtually uh, evil system that, uh, that drives populations into into penury and poverty and 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 destruction, which is what we've seen, especially the last ten years, but increasingly for about since 1971, almost 50 years. Right now, there is another system, and it is a government system that that most Americans really don't have an idea of. It's called in the 19th century, it was called the, the American system. It was created at the time of the founding of our nation and, and the adoption of the Constitution by Alexander Hamilton, his creation of a national bank, a national credit system, and a direction of, of lending that, as he stated in, his, in two of his reports to Congress, that the, the lending of money, in this case by the U.S. National Bank, which was, a, which was the U.S. government bank at the time, you know, that all lending must have a, uh, a means of repayment of the loans. Right? Now, the, that's what you absolutely don't have today. Right? You know, just giving out money to the banks, you know, and, and as essentially, call, it's called a loan, right? But there's no there's no investment in uh, in industry, in infrastructure, in scientific development and research that actually does produce real wealth. Right? So it is that you know that's the alternative system. You know that's what I represent in terms of the ideas I that I put forward, and uh, in my writings on infrastructure and other stuff. And, and I think I agree with you on on most of that. Um, there's, you know, we do that. That is, you know, the the fractional reserve system is. I guess it's. You really have it at two levels. You have you have the Federal Reserve doing this with the banks, and then you have the banks doing it with us. And and the one with us is more of the fractional reserve system. The Federal Reserve kind of does it at another level when they when they lend to the banks. Um, so I, I agree with you on that. Um, but when I see things like, okay, so, so, so let me use your example of, um, you have a corporation that says, let's say they have a lot of money overseas. They don't want to bring it back because it's going to be taxed, but now they get a tax break. So they're going to bring this money back and they're going to use this money to buy their own stock. Right. Yep. So, <laughs> so, so what a lot of people will say is, see, they're, they're investing this money in themselves. And so, um, and so it magically just, you know, the, the, the 0 0.1%, 0 0.001%, these, these big corporation owners now took all this money and they just stuck it in their own pocket. But really that's not what, that's not what's happening because if, if let's say they bring back a hundred billion dollars and let's say it's, it's like, let's say it's, um, Exxon, right? They bring back a hundred billion dollars and the, the, um, the board of Exxon says, hey, we're going to take this $100 billion and we're going to buy back $100 billion of our own stock. Who are they going to buy that $100 billion worth of stock from? Well, the, uh, the other stockholders, obviously. <laughs> exactly. And if the price is going up, then basically what they're doing is they're taking that money that was overseas – and now they're distributing it among um, whether it's individuals who are holding that stock, whether it's individuals who have money in their 401ks that are invested in that stock. And that's driving the price up. And if, because you can't, you know, no, you can't just buy stock and then that's it. There's there's for every transaction, there's a buy and a sell. So I think that money is actually going back into the economy, but it's 
it's kind of at an unseen level because it's it's you see them buying their own stock, but you don't see, OK, who's selling the stock to them. Um, and, and sure, there are some big banks who are going to profit off of that. But a lot of them like how, how do a lot of big banks get their money, especially investment firms from their investors who who deposit. And now, of course, this is all still built on top of that fractional reserve system. But I, I think um, I think it's wrong to say that that they're keeping all the money for themselves and it's not going into the economy when they someone literally has to sell the stock back to them in order for them to buy it. Yeah, well, well, look at a, I'll look at it a little bit uh, over a longer term. This is the uh, it's portrayed as the 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 longest uh, bear market or bull market in bull market in in history. Right, it's been mm-hmm. going up and up and up. With you know, stock, the Dow is over twenty thousand now. It used to be called the Dow Industrials, but there's yeah. I don't think there's any industrial firms on it now. <laughs> it's all it's Disneyland banks and and financial companies, right? So, uh, so so well, let's say that, you know you know, with the stock, the Dow went down to about eight thousand, if I remember right, after the crash in yep, in two thousand. Right. 2008, it's now over 20,000, right? So that's doubled, almost tripled, right? So the uh, so the, then we say, okay, what does that really represent? You know, does that mean that we've almost tripled the quality and and amount of our infrastructure? You know, has the wages of teachers tripled? You know, has has the uh, has there been a tripling of investment in fundamental scientific research and development, the space program, uh, you know, uh, of of investment in research on fusion power? Right? Have wages tripled? You know, the uh, you know, so it's really all money. You know, it doesn't really represent something real that human beings. Uh, would actually could actually measure in their day-to-day lives, right? You know, and you know, I, I think I'm a lot older than you. You know, I'm 74. You know, so uh, you know, I grew up in the 1950s and uh, became an adult in the early 60s, right? So the uh, uh, and I re- and you know, it, and it's really a completely different world we have then, right? Uh, at that time, my father was a construction worker, right? and so he could buy a new home. Uh, my mother did not work. You know, two children. You know, you know, he'd take two, three weeks vacation a year. You know, a new pickup truck every three years or so. Uh, full health insurance, you know, and be able to save money right? on one wage of a construction worker, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, I went to college and then university. My tuition at college was, you know, 150 a year. My tuition at the university was 300 a year. Uh, you know, the uh, and when I worked construction in the summer, you know, well, I'd make my year's tuition in in a week and a half, right? So, uh, you know, that was the norm. In the in the period, the clerk, you know, the the retail clerk at Penny's, same thing, right? That's the quality of life they had, or the population had then, you know, and you know, and we all know nobody can do that on one wage anymore. No family, right? right? You know, and I, so th- that's the de- that's the deterioration and and destruction of the real f- what I call physical economy. Of the nation over the the past 45, 50 years, and I'll just add one more point, and that is infrastructure. Right, the infrastructure we depend upon today was built in the 1930s, the 1940s, and into the 1960s. You know, I I do a, a weekly you know report on California water infrastructure and related areas, and I, and I know the history very well. Uh, the state of California absolutely depended upon the Franklin Roosevelt Central Valley Project and the California State Water Project to be 
the state that provides half of the fruits and vegetables for the whole country and other nations too, right? You know, but that was all built 650, 60, 70 years ago, and nothing's been built since. And that's why we have a water crisis in California now, right? So, yeah, but no I stop. I mean, so, well, let me ask you this, because, you know, I, I hear all the things you mentioned, and I agree with you that these are these are all problems. Of course, um, I I blame the government for every single one of them, and I, I can walk you through, um, you know, how. But what I'm interested in is what would your solution be, knowing what you know and, you know, knowing what we all agree on also, what would be your solution to fix all these problems? Well, the uh, little background you know i said i'm 74 years old I, I became a political activist in 1967 and uh and that was the year i graduated from the university right? uh 1967 and and that was the explosion of the vietnam war for, so for the next three years i was an activist uh working to stop the united states mass murder in in vietnam uh by 1970, I joined the uh, Lyndon LaRouche Political Organization, and that's what I'm in today, you know, 47 years, 48 years later. And, uh, and what we've put forward is a, uh, is a comprehensive policy for the world and for the United States. And, and, and that, begin, you know, just, just to kind of summarize it, in four points. One, restore the Glass-Steagall banking law, which was repealed in 1999 and did lead to the collapse in 2008. Uh, and then restore a national credit system where, as Alexander Hamilton put forward, where the, the investment, you know, both from revenue sources of the government and private investment is is directed toward fundamental areas of building infrastructure, industry, the space program, research development, infusion, that sort of thing, in real physical economy. And then thirdly, is you, you must sustain and maintain the, the well-being of the population. Right? That means no attacks on Social Security, Medicare, and other government programs that are fundamental to the well-being of tens of millions of Americans today. Right? You can't just cut things off, you know, unless you really want to kill people. Right? Uh, yep. And then fourthly, a, a really a, a great expanded scientific research and, and development policy f uh, focused on the space program and fusion. Right. So that's what I would do. Right. Is, you know, one, two, three, so, four. So, OK, so let's let's talk about um, scientific investment. Um, so it's, you know, as as you know, my my opinion is to keep government out of everything. What I see, you know, the the environment I'm in and, and where I work, I see a lot of money going into scientific research. Um, it's true that, you know, a, a lot of it goes into for profit things, but we also see, um, you know, there's there's investment into solar technology, um, everything from self-driving vehicles, which which improves the economy, um, saves lives, um, you know, all these other things. We have a, a private company that's that's now launching um, test flights into space that that hopefully they'll be able to take satellites up and, and everything for just a fraction of, a, of the cost of what NASA was doing. Um, I, I see in the private sector, a lot of this is really going on now. And and, you know, let's not even let's not even forget, um, you know, when we talk about even aerospace, the, the first airplanes were invented by private individuals. That wasn't that wasn't a government venture. Um, television, radio, you know, um, the Internet, I know a lot of people argue that the Internet was was created by the government, but um, Al, Al Gore did not do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so I, I see, you know, most of the technology and, and I'm not going to say government didn't invent anything. You know, they, they obviously did spend a lot of money on, on some specific things that would have benefited them. 
um, mostly I, you know, in my opinion, mostly that would have benefited their their war power. But I see I see a lot of a lot of the technology that we have today came from private investment, and I think that, you know, we we do have. I mean, the government. It's hard to say, like, you know, you've got the private sector because the government is like there is no separation from the private sector and the government. They're all tied together so well. So, for example, you've got you've got oil corporations who are lobbying to to keep, um, you know, solar companies and and uh, clean natural gas and all these other things. Um, fusion and fission and, and all these other things They're you know, they don't like that stuff because it takes away their profits from oil. But a lot of how they control that is is through their um through their controlling of of government they you know oil companies are able to keep their prices down by taking subsidies from government which comes from taxpayers but if you get rid of that then the the you know the profit margin starts shrinking and these companies are forced to raise their prices on gasoline which means there's more of an incentive for the consumer to say hey i'm going to switch to to natural gas or i'm going to switch to solar um because it's it's not so cheap anymore um, because the gas, the, the gas, the coal, these other things aren't so cheap anymore. Um, so I, I think we'd see a lot more growth in some of these technologies if the government kind of stepped back and said, said, you know, hey, we're going to stop messing with the markets. We're going to stop messing with investments and regulations and and all these other things. Yeah, the uh, uh, much of what you said is true. Uh, you, in fact, what is what is the fundamental driver of economic progress? It's human creativity, right? And that's individual. That is personal. It, 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 individual or creativity does not come from a group, right? It is discoveries by individuals uh, who then communicate the discovery. You know, that, that's fundamental principle of science, whether it's Kepler and early 1600s discovery of the actual organization of the solar system or Einstein 100 years ago with the uh, completely overthrowing all of physics with his uh, development of, of relativity, right? which then led to the development of, of and, and uh, begin mastering of nuclear processes, for example, right? You know, so that's individual discovery. And, and one thing on Einstein, which then gets at this creativity idea a little more, is uh, he's asked, you know, well, what is your inspiration? How, how do you make, come up with these brand new ideas that never existed before? And he said, it's right here in my violin. It's in Mozart, right? That's what inspires me and 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 allows my mind to be free to develop new ideas right so so it's it's human individual creativity you know so i would agree with you you know that that it that scientific discovery is individual and and you know call it private or whatever that's fine right but it is but we are you know uh, social beings, and that that individual discovery would 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 go nowhere unless it's socialized, and then brought into cooperative action to actually build something with it, right? You know that you know so corporations do that, right? Uh, it's, which is a social structure, social, political, economic structure, right? But I'll go back, you know, back to the 30s again, and when when you have then the power of corporations or banks, especially banks and trust funds back in the 20s and 30s, you know, that that have control over electricity generation and distribution, as it did in the 20s and 30s, right? Then, you know, and by 19 in 1936. 10% of U.S. farms had electricity, just 10%, right? Sweden had nine, 90%. Japan had 80% of the farms with, with actually had electricity. Well, why didn't American farms have electricity? Because private corporations owned uh, the entire electrical power system. <coughs> 
excuse me. <coughs> One second here. Okay, so so Franklin Roosevelt, president then, you know, created the the uh, rural electrification uh, uh, organization, which uh, <clears throat> by by essentially executive directive direction allowed for farmers to create co-ops and then come to the government and borrow uh, what is required for that group of farmers to both either create power gen electrical power generation uh, and the laying the lines and bringing electricity to the farms right and 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 they borrow borrow directly from the government at two to three percent interest, right? And over the next about 16, 18 years, by early 1950s, 90% uh, of the farms by 1953 were electrified, right? Uh, but what did the private power companies say? You know, well, we're not going to run a line 20 miles outside the city to one farm, right? You know? That, you know, if you want to do that, it'll cost you ten thousand dollars. You know, and, and farm income in 1936 is about eight hundred dollars a year, right? You know, so you know ten thousand dollars to electrify your farm. You know, well, what was the effect of it? Right? Well, well I a, think that that makes. Uh, I mean, that that really is the same. Um, so, so you're saying a couple different things here. First, you were, I think, you compared it to. What, did you say Sweden, where they had ninety percent? Yeah, eighty percent or so. 80, okay, so Sweden is obviously a much smaller country than the United States, so it's easier for them to to have you know to to build a complete grid with with a, a lower price. You know, like you said, dragging cables across you know so many miles might cost a lot of money, um, and we see that. And and so actually, the government's solution to that was actually not that. It was not to drag. It it wasn't that the government said we're going to do that same thing and drag the cables. It was. It was we're going to lend you money so that you can create your own, um, basically your own generator in different places. Now, this realistically is, um, you know, I look at this and I say in in this capacity, government was sort of acting as as a private company. That could have been a bank. It could have been, um, it could you know, it could have been any uh, group of investors who said, oh, we're gonna we see a need in the market that they want electricity, so we're gonna we're gonna go around and we're going to build generators and we're going to you know either lend them the money or rent them the the use of it. Um, and, and I think that that you know there would be a way for that to happen without government. My my main issue with government is that um, if you know, let's say the farms were like, hey. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting along just fine here without electricity, so it's not worth it for us to borrow the, the money at, let's say, 5 or 6%. If it were 2 or 3, we'd borrow it. If it's 5 or 6%, it's not worth it to us. We're, we're doing just fine here. Um, and for them to say, you know, okay, so uh, so it, the, the, uh, the interest rate is 5%. We're not going to borrow the money. We're just going to keep doing it the way we're doing it. Um, but then for the government to say, because taxation is theft, where is the government's money coming from? And let's say they're stealing it from those very farmers. They're, they're taking the farmer's money, and now they're saying, hey, we have all this money that we can lend to you. So if you want to borrow this money, you can build a generator. The, the reality is whenever you have a government program that's, that's giving someone money, the, the government doesn't produce anything and sell it for a profit. So that money has to, has to have been taken um, from somebody else. And so when you have, you know, it's like it's like we can all get together and we can give money to the government for um, for these these farm generators. Um, and then eventually. But what's going to happen is the, the government has to has to pay its employees. It, it pays its its congressmen extremely well. Um, it pays all of its um, most of its employees extremely well, too. And eventually, like we're, we're going to give all this money to the government and it's going to it's going to get passed down, you know, from hands to hands. And then they're going to charge interest on it, um, on that money on top of it and give that to the farmers when realistically we the farmers could have just said, hey, we're going to charge you a little bit more, but we're going to be able to produce more food of higher quality um, and we'll pay 
we'll pay a little bit more to the farmers instead of to the government. They're going to take that money that they earn and they're going to pay a little bit more for this for this electricity. They're going to they're going to raise the money themselves and they're not going to pay interest on it because they're not borrowing it from someone else. So it's kind of like every time the money changes hands, somebody else is going to make a profit. Meanwhile, you've got government is, you know, the, the people who create the generators, let them earn a little bit of a profit because they're contributing an actual value to the production of the food. Um, for, for everybody else who's, who's involved in that system, you know, the, the farmers, let them earn a little bit of profit because obviously, oh, my camera just shut off. Um, because obviously, uh, you know, they're, they're producing something of value and that's helping the economy and that's, that's feeding people. So, so let them earn that profit. But then you have government and what exactly are they doing? What's their actual role in this, in, in producing this value? And the reality is all they're doing is they're taking money from from some people they're giving it back to other people and they're they're taking half of it and sticking it in their pockets and keeping it for themselves um so so the system that you described it sounds like it actually works really well i would just say let them borrow that money from somebody that's not government yeah well the private power companies did everything they could to sabotage the uh Rural Electrification Administration, uh, you know, literally through through uh, through their uh, the congressmen they owned, you know, that the political manipulation, but they also sent out crews to destroy the uh, uh, new power lines being put in by the co-ops, right? You know, and this went on for for a couple of years or so before. Uh, you know, further legislation, you know, literally castrated all these huge power companies that were financial trusts. They really weren't power companies, you know. Uh, but 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 I'll I'll switch it to to one 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 other example that I know very well. That's the building of the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, mm-hmm. right? But but it was uh, a dream that. Uh, a handful of people had in Washington State, uh, you know, back as, as you know, as early as 1918 or so, and and a few people really were fighting for this. But 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt came in, he said, "Okay, let's build it." Right? And through the uh, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was a fund of 100 million or so at the time, which had been created by Hoover to bail out the banks in the first three years of the Depression, right? But Roosevelt took it and said, no, we're not going to bail out the banks anymore. You know, and it had the bank holiday, for example, you know, as soon as the day, literally the day he came into office, you know, but but later, a uh, couple, three months later, uh, so it's in summer of 1933, he said, let's build the Grand Coulee Dam. And So the first funding for that came out of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which is already allocated monies by the Congress, and over and it was completed in 1941. The the biggest, uh, most massive uh, uh, construction project in human history, and it remained the largest uh, structure built by human beings for another 30 or 40 years, right? and so, and it took you know so it took about eight years to build, and 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 uh, it cost about 100, 150 million total over those eight eight years to build it, which came from uh, both the WPA and and other of the agencies created by FDR in, in the New Deal, right, and also direct allocations by Congress. Uh, now, so it cost $150 million to build. And as Alexander Hamilton made very clear in, in that any government money that's loaned must have a means of repayment built into that loan, right? And that's, that's what's lost with all this stuff, you know, especially you focus on, right? You know, there's no means of repayment. You know, unless you're going to steal it from somebody, right. <laughs> So, but you know, so 150 million, and in the 70 
plus years since the dam was completed, uh, it uh, the uh, just direct revenues from selling electricity, right, has been in the billions. You know, I think you know, 20 years ago was over four billion, you know, revenue just from selling electricity. So it paid for itself, right? It's owned by the government, you know, and it sells the electricity. Uh, and and that doesn't even count the irrigation side, right? Which turned you know most of eastern Washington into a a garden of of production of fruit and vegetables. So uh, and and wheat, you know. So so that's you know. And there's no way any corporation, any group of private individuals who could have ever financed and built that that dam. And that's the same. You know, from the Central Valley Project of California, the state, the the uh, private individuals had been talking about a huge uh, irrigation project for the Central Valley of California. You know, the 400 miles long and about 100 miles wide, you know, of perfect Mediterranean climate just needed water. Right, so, uh, so. By the early 30s, the state of California said, Let's, we've got to build this, right? And, uh, but that was the Depression. The state could never finance it, so the federal government stepped in, and, and it financed it. Right? And uh, the project actually is never completed uh, to this day in terms of all the elements of it. But it did create you know, the greatest production of fruits and vegetables on the planet okay uh it, it's it's incredible so so, so this we, leads we, me, sorry go ahead yeah it lead me to my one the conclusion i kind of want to make here that is economy is not really about money right it's about the the mastering of nature of discovering the fundamental principles of the organization of, of nature of, of the universe right and and a, and then applying that knowledge to create this, the technology the products the the uh, processes that increase the living conditions and improve the living conditions of mankind right and and so the purpose of the economy is not for you and me to have more money because money in itself you know it's just paper right you know mm-hmm. you know you, and uh, you can burn it and and you really don't change anything right? yeah <laughs> right? can't eat Nothing. it they can't eat it you know uh, uh, you know so 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 when we talk about economy it is how do we uplift Humanity. How do we create a more productive workforce, high, more highly skilled, more encultured, especially, uh, and and generally improve you know, humanity's future? So, when we talk about economy, we we should always be looking fifty, a hundred years into the future, and that's what a nation can do. Individuals really can't do that except as they participate with others in saying, okay, 50 years from now, we're going to cover this country with with maglev transportation system, maglev rail transportation systems, you know, and, and completely eliminate, uh, uh, at least in inner city uh, uh, transport, you know, trucking. You know, get all the damn trucks off the freeway. <laughs> you know, and uh, and and that's what we sh- we should have as our idea of what the economy is, and it's the cooperation. You know, and you have to have a government that that actually has that kind of idea. But we have not had a government like that since John Kennedy. Okay? You know, and and so your entire lifetime, you know. You've never seen a government that actually worked, you know. I did when I was a young man. You know, I saw you know the space program, the Apollo project, and all that, right? 
You know, there was more than, you know, half a million people directly involved in putting a man on the moon. Right? You know, now, most of that was contractors. Right? NASA coordinated it, and taxpayer money paid it. That's true. Right? But it was ha nearly half a million people at Ford and GM and, uh, and, a, and thousands of other companies that employed people. And and the the uh, and the repayment to the economy was ten to one. For every dollar we put into NASA, you know, the actual economic effects was was ten dollars of actual real generation of economic activity. Right? And and so, you know, I'll stop there. And, All right. You know, well, so so it's let fun. me. Yeah, let me give a, a couple thoughts in, in the opposite direction on that. So, so one, um, so I'm a software engineer. I work with computer systems and, and all kinds of technology. And what I've seen is, so, so we have, you know, you talk about these, these big projects. Um, and the, the way things are moving now in, in the computer science industry is, it used to be towards let's let's build bigger computers, supercomputers, giant computers, um, and and really what things are going towards now is is like a lot of people are understanding that um, even even in designing smaller businesses, having a monolithic um, structure is is not a good idea because if one thing goes wrong, then you you have catastrophic failure. So let's talk about this dam for example. If this dam were to fail, have a failure where the power would stop being generated from it, how many people would that put out of power? Whereas if you would have, instead of building one monolithic, um, you built, um, you know, 20 or 30 smaller, you know, hydroelectric plants in, in different places. If one of them goes out, it's not a big deal. The, the you know, you can get power from a different place. Um, and, and so this is the same way this is the same way technology is moving. Um, you know, we we don't see um, we don't see so many big supercomputers being built anymore. We see more distributed systems um, where, you know, banks banks can they can have one central ledger for like a thousand different branches or they can if that central system goes down or if the power goes out on like, you know, one of the routes to that to that central system that bank has to shut down. It's out of business or not out of business, but it's, it's out of commission until the power comes back up. But if that, if that bank were to have its own ledgers closer at home, and if it were able to communicate with other branches directly, then if, if whatever that central, um, you know, corporate bank is that goes down, then, you know, the other banks can still operate without it. And so now when you talk about like a, like a maglev system, um, sure, that's it's it's big, it's great. It's um, it, it might be able to transport a lot from from one place to another um, on less fuel even. But um, what happens if if you know if if something happens to one small part of that system that causes the entire one entire stretch of that of that um, track to be shut down? Versus what if we were to create you know take the roads that we already have. And, and use individual trucks and, and have those trucks drive from point A to point B, but using, you know, using um, uh, uh, self-driving trucks where they don't need to be manned anymore. And then plus we're, uh, we're, we're already looking at electronic trucks that, that use electrical power um, instead of gas power. And these are, these are amazingly more efficient and more powerful. Um, so, so there's all kinds of – there's different solutions to everything. And, and having, you know, not focusing on, on monolithic and focusing on smaller compartmentalized makes makes a little bit more sense sometimes. And here's here's another example with, you know, with like the maglev. So um, let's say, for example, you have you have these giant ships coming from China. Right. And they all have these containers that ship can't it can't go to Texas. It can't go to um, to Ohio. Um, it has to stop at the coast and what happens you take those things off and you stick them on little trucks and the trucks take them to where they're going or you put them on a train which is one big unit that can move a lot all at one time but then you know the the train station only goes so far you still have to take it off and put it on trucks for local delivery so there's still um you know whereas you you might be able to say okay if if we have a system of automated trucks that that can drive you know self-driving trucks um, you can have a system where 
they get on the highway and now instead of um uh instead of each you know each driving as their own component where they have a lot of wind resistance they can now because they're self-driving and computerized and and can be um very accurate with their with their movement you could have something where you know 500 trucks get on the highway and now they're they're back to back which means there's there's very little um air resistance for for each one because the air is now it's it's now moving like a train and it takes you know as much energy to move as a train now uh, maybe not as little as maglev but um a, a lot less than than a system w that we have now um you're able to do that but then when you get to the end of the highway where this truck now needs to go to a local delivery you don't need to you don't need to have all these giant machines that are now going to lift the 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 back uh, the you know the the container off of the train and stick it onto a truck now the truck just separates from the herd and can and can you know go its local route and maybe it can find other trucks and do the same thing and, and save on air resistance there so i i think and, and my point is not to say that this is a perfect system by any means but my my point is to say that you know yes the government could have come along and, and done something that maybe nobody else could have done but you can't necessarily say because no one's no one's psychic if the government had not done that would we still have come up with something that did change the world in and have just as big of a change? We don't know. Um, could something better have happened instead that now we're not looking for answers anymore because that that question's been solved for now? Uh, we'll never know. Um, we, you know, it's, it's kind of like did if, if Columbus didn't discover America, which that's not even the true story. But if Columbus didn't discover America, nobody else would have. It, it's kind of like saying that. Um, the reality is if government didn't do all these big projects, most likely somebody else would have. And, and I understand your argument, too, about, you know, you're talking about power companies going around and and, um, you know, interfering with with private individuals trying to build their own power supplies. And, they you know, that's that's a criminal act. And, and you know, that's I, I agree with you. This that's completely uncalled for. And that should be that should be punished criminally. Um, but I, I think, you know, government interfering by taking money from from a lot of people and saying, this is what we think is best for society. We're going to spend all this money. It's it's they might make the right decision a couple times. But what happens when they make the wrong decisions? You end up with things like Vietnam. You end up with these with all these senseless wars, um, you end up with a lot of money going into building, um, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Um, it's, it's, it's a power, you know, it's a, it's, it's a power that they can either use properly or they can abuse. And we have no control over whether it's used properly or abused. And that's, that's one of the biggest problems I see with government. Well, that's the political question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this nation was created, uh, from with the idea that we will ha we will have a representative government that the people will participate in creating and running monitoring disciplining and it will actually represent the people of the of the nation right? and when you read the preamble of the US constitution which i urge everybody to do a few times uh, I know in school, we never read it, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know we but, did. I remember reading that. You know, but, you know, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, right? Well, you know, what does that mean? You know, well, we've created a union, but it's not perfect, right? And that the, the nation is a process of development and increasing being being less imperfect increasingly, right? Uh, that that the purpose is to uh, you know provide for the national defense and defend the general welfare of all the people and their posterity, right? Now, and and that's telling us that our responsibility as citizens is not just to our own personal interests today but that we have a responsibility to give to the future generations unborn, you know, something better than what we found, you know, that was handed to us by those who built what, 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 uh, 
what we have, right? And and that's why I, I you know, I really have made a, a, you know, call it a career, you know, if you want to, but it's not really, but it, you know, uh, of this question of inf infrastructure, because in 1962 and 63, President John Kennedy uh, inaugurated, oh, half a dozen or more water projects, mostly in the West, you know, and, and in almost all the speeches he gave inaugurating them, he would say something like, you know, you know, you know, what we're beginning with this project will not be completed for 20 years or more. It's not for our benefit today. It is for the benefit of those, you know, who will come after us, right? And, you know, of course, we've not had a, a president that has even come close to saying something like that, you know, since Kennedy, right? And, but it, but it is, but that is the idea of our posterity, you know, as the responsibility of us as citizens is to that posterity. Uh, and so I'm, I'm always oriented toward, well, how do we s solve problems where you have, you know, nearly a billion people on this planet that do not have access to electricity, right? And, and more than a billion who, who, who go, go to bed hungry. Uh, and in fact, when we look at the United States, you have one quarter of America's children who do not have enough to eat at least a few days a month. Right? You know, and, and when, I, when I was 20, 22 years old, you know, I, said, I said to myself, I said, within a decade or less, we're gonna eliminate world poverty. Right? And, and that was kind of the spirit of the age you know, uh, under President John Kennedy, right? And, and that, that created in the minds of a lot of people like myself, young people like myself, that, that we really are gonna change and make the whole world better, right? Um, and I think that's, that's really what economics, money and finance and discussion of government role and all that really has to orient toward, you know? I mean, that's why, I've, done what I've done for 50 years. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this, if, because I, you know, I agree with that vision of the future that, you know, we shouldn't have, um, we shouldn't have people in poverty. Although, um, I, well, I will say that that is subjective, um, because there are people who live without electricity, and they're perfectly happy with that. Um, without food, of course, is a different story. But um, in different places of the world, you know, what, what people want, you know, some people can't imagine life without a mansion. Meanwhile, you have people in, in small houses or even living in grass huts, and they're perfectly happy with, with you know, with their living situation. Um, but, of course, you know, if somebody's going hungry, that's, that's pretty much a problem for anyone, um, unless they're, you know, they've got some mental condition. But, you know, that's, that's a problem for anyone. But so, so I agree with you on, like, I guess that, you know, okay, the, the world has all these problems and we should figure out how to solve them. Um, I, I guess my, my main belief in that is, is, you know, when it comes to government is that, you know, they pay for it with taxes. And I say, well, let's find a different way to raise the money for such a project other than stealing it from people. Um, but, but to your point about, um, I, I guess where I'm going, um, you know, okay. So, so, if the government is supposed to be representative of the people to, to how do you see, uh, what do you think is necessary for that to change? Because right now, you know, so many people are upset. Um, you know, I work with a lot of people in the, in, in movements who want to end the drug war because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're arresting so many young people, minorities, um, you know, they're, they're creating wars and violence. They're, they're killing innocent people. Um, they're, by going on, by opening the wrong door, um, it's, it, there's, there's really a lot of really bad things going on here. And most of the country wants to put an end to it, but nobody listens to us, even though it's supposed to be our government that's supposed to represent us. What do you think, what do you think went wrong there? And, and how do you think we can possibly change that? Well, the drug war, the drugs issue, you know, I mean, 70 70,000 people a year die of overdose of opioids in the U.S. now, 
Mm-hmm. Right, and most of the a lot of those people are That's opioids, right? Right, and a lot of those are prescription opioids. And we have yes, we've seen absolutely. like in 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 Colorado, once they legalized marijuana, people started using which you can't overdose on. They're using that now instead, and their their opioid over overdose rates have dropped because of that. Well, maybe maybe not, but anyway, they, here's the point I want to make on it. You know, is, is that the 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 drug cartels, right? The pharma industry, you know, deliberately addicted people to opioids, right? That I mean, that's well documented. Uh, uh, you know, and that's a, that is criminal, right? I mean, that is you know beyond criminal. Right? You know, it's if we had the death penalty for that sort of stuff, then it should be applied. You know, or or maybe a Nuremberg Tribunal, crimes against humanity, but, right? But but, but, but do you do that to the to the people who created the drug and, and distributed it, or do you do it to the people who are who are using it because they're? They, I mean, if anything, those are the victims, but those are the people who are yeah. being locked up. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree with you. You know, who should be locked up? Well, during the Obama administration, you know, Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank, you know, Citibank, Chase, you know, all the big ones, right, you know, made deals with the Justice Department. They did not plead guilty, but they pleaded no contest to billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of drug money laundering from the Mexican cartels, you know. Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank, especially directly with the Hong, with with the Mexican cartels, right? And so, no no criminal charges, and no and obviously no trials or jail sentence for those who admitted that they broke the law in drug money laundering, right? You know, and it it is that you know if you shut down the uh, uh, a guy named Acosta, who was the head, of, you know, uh, a head, the head of the United Nations uh, Commission on Organized Crime, International Crime, and 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 Narcotics. Right? He made, he he said it very clearly just a few years ago. He said after the 2008 collapse, the only reason the banks did not go under, you know, was not so much from the bailout but from the laundering of drug money by the hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, the drug money from the cartels, you know, especially Afghanistan, Mexico, and a few others, right, kept the banks afloat, right? You know, so, I mean, the, the, you know, so, so the, the system is criminal, right? You know, and, and what, you, what you've, you've uh, uh, hit on, especially in the drug question, you know, is the symptoms of the criminal system, right? And you've got to just shut this whole damn system down, right? Uh, you know, just put the That's... whole banking financial system into bankruptcy receivership, you know, and sort out, you know, the legitimate debts from from the speculative derivatives, drug money laundering, and it all zero that out, you know. And if, if bankers have to then become janitors, well, that's too bad, you know. Uh, let them do so. You know, at least do something useful, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but, but also, what about our representation? Like what? Because these are the these are the people who are making the policies that are affecting all of this. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a revolution going on, and and, and uh, you know, there's a from below there is a revolt underway. We've seen it the last two, three years or so. The Brexit vote in Britain, right? You know, the election of Trump, right? I mean, he he ran to destroy the 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 establishment Republican structure, Republican Party structure, and he did, right? And then he, you know, then he destroyed with the help of Hillary Clinton the Democratic Party structure, right? Good, you know, they they both de- deserve to be destroyed, right? Now now. Trump's a pretty wild guy, you know, but he does represent that revolt from below, even though most of the, the uh, supporters, and I'm a political organizer, so I, I talk to all kinds of people all the time, and I know that that, that most of the, the, the strong support for Trump is, is, you know, is fairly narrow, fairly shallow in terms of what people actually understand, 
right? But it is a revolt. It is, you know, and it's continuing. Now, the, uh, uh, and, I, and I'll say one more thing on it, which, which or somewhat different direction, that, that uh, two weeks ago, there was a conference in China, uh, the uh, Forum on China-African Co Cooperation. 54 heads of state of African nations were in China. I mean, something like this has never happened before. Right? But did you see anything on the news on it in the U.S.? No, there's not a word. I mean, this is heads of state of 54 countries of Africa, and they're in China. Right? And, and it's accelerating the investment of the building of infrastructure and, and uh, industry uh, roads and hospitals and and everything else in in multiple African nations and for the first time ever the poverty rate in Africa is going down right and this is all due to China investment in and uh, uh, the uh, very few people know this but the country that has the highest GDP growth annually for the last three years is Ethiopia. Right? You, know, the, the, you know, that's shocking. You know, Ethiopia, yeah. I, I thought that was a backward country. Well, it's over 10% annual growth rate per year of real economy, not financial transactions, but of, the, of uplifting of the population into to, uh, hundreds of thousands of industrial jobs jobs where people get a decent wage and they can actually support a family. You know, so so there's something going on in the world that that I like. <laughs> so uh, what we have to do in the United States, I mean, we effectively need a real revolution, you know, to uh, uh, destroy the existing system. You know, and you and I may disagree on what should replace it exactly, but I think we're on the same wavelength in terms of what the problem is, and and absolutely, and what and what you know, and more what the result we want to see should be. Definitely. You know? Well, I, I think we're at about time for today, but um, you you have um, you said you have like a, a podcast. Do you want to give me your website and anything no. else? Well, no, I I I write a weekly report. Uh, on California water infrastructure and related areas, which which goes more broadly into political and economic stuff too, uh, and the website is uh, CaliforniaDroughtUpdate.org, and on Facebook it's California Drought Report. You know, it's a weekly report I write. Uh, I have some videos on YouTube. Uh, on presentations like the building of the Grand Coulee Dam I mentioned and California Water Projects and other that under Pat Ruckert under the uh, uh, on YouTube. You know, so okay, cool, awesome. Well, it was great talking with you and and even though you don't think that taxation is theft, I think you're a pretty cool guy. You, you've got yes. um, you, you, we definitely agree on a lot of things and. For for my audience, who is mostly the taxation is theft, you know, if if you're watching this, uh, this is what happens when you talk to people who might not agree with you on everything. You find out that there's actually a lot of common ground and and interesting thoughts come out. And this is how we work together, even though we don't always think exactly the same. So um, that's that's my spiel for today. Um, all right, Pat. Again, it was great talking with you, and um, I'll uh, maybe we'll see you again sometime. Okay, a dialogue is really good. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and I think that's what we had today. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank right. you. I appreciate I'll see you it. Bye-bye.